Hello everyone and welcome to video 327 for the Legal Studies Guy. Uh, today we're going to look at need for legal representation. Uh, but first a quote from Rosa Luxemburg. Those who do not move do not notice their chains, aka, okay? um, yeah, if you're just in a state of inertia, if you don't want to, you know, get up and get moving and, and do the work that you need to do, um, whatever that is, both in terms of school but also in life, um, then you won't notice the barriers that are around you and the things that you can fix. So effectively just that, you know, idea of showing up, um, getting to work, uh, you know, basically just getting into it is the starting point um, and the rest will flow from there. So, yeah, 327, we're talking today about the need for legal practitioners in a civil dispute. This is really building off that last um, video um on the roles of key personnel in a civil dispute, um, much like it did in Area 3.1. So um, there'll be connection between these two videos, particularly around the key skills. Um, so we won't go into them as much detail in this video, just because we've covered that skill in the last one. Um, hopefully by the end of this, you are able to really explain what lawyers are going to do for someone in a civil matter. Um, and really get across the point of why if someone does want to pursue a civil matter in any way, shape or form, they should be getting themselves a legal practitioner um, or it's, yeah, advised more or less that they would. So same structure as um, in 3.1. We're just going to start with what is a legal practitioner? Um, what are they? What do they do? Um, so as we know, um, party control is a big feature of um, – I guess the role played by the plaintiff and the defendant in a civil matter. Um, and generally speaking, <clears throat> as part of party control, you will get yourself a trained lawyer to represent you and manage your case um, because it's very complex um, and it's very hard to do by yourself. Um, individuals are able to self-represent, so you can be what's called a self-represented litigant. Um, I'll link you in later with a um, the guide for how you basically do that on the county court website. So the, the courts are generally quite helpful um, to self-represented litigants on process and, and, you know, filing documents and what they need to do to keep things ticking. Um, but obviously the you're not going to be able to do that as effectively and as, as efficiently as a lawyer if you're a self-represented litigant um, plus... Obviously, when you get to trial, when you know you've got to actually make your arguments and deliver your evidence, um, that's where you're going to be at a serious disadvantage. But you are able to self-represent, and I'll um, I'll give you an indication of what the support for that looks like later. Um, certainly, at some lists at VCAT um, and with CAV, you do have to self-represent, so you can't use lawyers um, through. CAB if you're using their limited conciliation services. Um, and some lists at VCAT, you're not allowed to use a lawyer. So, for example, a goods and services claim under $15,000 at VCAT, you're not allowed to use a lawyer. Um, lawyers are prohibited. Um, same for same for generally businesses. Um, there are some exceptions. Um, but, yeah, so often when we talk about the need for legal practitioners, we might be veering towards what we would consider more complex matters with more money involved um, is definitely where lawyers are going to be needed because um, you can um, self-represent, but it is obviously, again, advised. Um, and just like criminal law, you've got your solicitors who are managing the case overall and then your barristers who are presenting the case within the trial um, and, and advocacy within court. Um that as a result, I mean, solicitors have a big role in criminal law as well, but um, solicitors have a huge role in civil law in terms of the um, uh, discovery um, phase, disclosure, discovery of documents. Um, you know, there'll be um, sometimes oral examination of witnesses before trial, Um what you might see in American TV shows called um, depositions or similar um, that solicitors are aware part of. So solicitors have a huge role in civil law with a lot of that out-of-court stuff um, and overall management of a case. Um, so in going through what lawyers are, we've really touched on their role as well. 
Um, it's about basically advising their client on the best steps, um, using their legal expertise to try and resolve the case. This can include figuring out where to initiate disputes. So where do you actually want to go to get the best resolution? You might see a lawyer before you decide on that. Um, it might not even be initiating a dispute at an institution. It might be the lawyer sending, say, a letter of demand to the other party and corresponding with them or with their lawyers um, to do effectively some negotiation before you even consider using formal methods or formal institutions to resolve the dispute. Um, but then if ultimately that doesn't work, none of that negotiation works, it will generally be up to, if you are using a lawyer, they'll advise you on where you should go and then they'll prepare all the paperwork required to initiate the claim in that location. Uh, Pre-trial procedures um, and processes like we just talked about in that last slide, so disclosure um, of evidence, discovery of documents, um, yeah, sometimes interrogatories, which is, you know, sending off questions to the other party, um, could be, yeah, having to, you know, oral, oral examination of um, witnesses, um, you know, Often you have to apply to the court for all of these things or you have to, you know, basically apply to get orders to get access to documents, things like that. Um, that's paperwork that has to be submitted, prepared first, then the documents will arrive and then you've got to sort through the documents and figure out if they help you or not. These is, this is all work that is best done by lawyers um, and that's the role that lawyers will play. So managing and engaging in those pretrial procedures. Um, if there's a mediation, they'll go to the mediation and support you. Um, with, yeah, basically how you conduct yourself at the mediation and might run that mediation for you in terms of your viewpoint. Uh, and then ultimately, if a matter does go to trial or to a hearing, uh, a legal practitioner will then present your case. So, um, again, you have party control over your case and organising your um, legal practitioners, and then they will run the case, examine, cross-examine witnesses, prepare documents, um, lead that evidence, deliver opening, closing addresses, etc. Uh, and if you need to review what they are, um, the overarching obligations are in our last video. Legal practitioners have to abide by those overarching obligations as well. So, um, you know, it takes reasonable steps to resolve the dispute, um, act honestly, et cetera, et cetera. So why do we need them? Um, all pretty straightforward, and I've linked all of these points to the principles of justice, which I think is always really important around the need for legal practitioners. If you have a legal practitioner and the other party has a legal practitioner, first and foremost, neither of you are at a disadvantage. So there's a semblance of equality immediately off the bat. Um, if we then turn our attention to access, which are these three points here, um, they're going to uh, provide you with advice and information. You're going to better understand what's happening if you have a lawyer, which means access because you're better able to engage. They're going to help you initiate a dispute in the first place. That's access, getting your chance to have dispute resolution. Um, they should, as a result, make the system work more efficiently because they're going to be able to do all these things far quicker than self-represented litigants will be able to. That should help the rest of the justice system work um, to provide access to all parties. Uh, and finally, ultimately, having a lawyer means you're going to present your case in the best possible way. Um, and that's fundamental events. If both parties are presenting their cases in the best possible way, we're going to get the just correct app, which is ultimately fairness. Now, we've got this compare role. Again, a reminder that when we say compare, we want to make sure we are doing similarities and differences. So, um, Again, thinking that's the safest way to make sure you're a chance of getting full marks, even though we don't necessarily have it entirely clear that compare will be similarities and differences. Um, I think it's the safest way to go. I think um, if they didn't want... Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it seems um, unlikely that they would just want you to know similarities. It seems incredibly unlikely. So anytime you see compare, you should be making sure that you do both of those things. Um, so similarities and differences to criminal law, how legal practitioners work in criminal law. Um, the similarities are pretty straightforward. You know, you're using their legal expertise to support a client, um, question witnesses, etc., deliver arguments, have an obligation to the court first and foremost. So it's all around that support and use of their legal expertise. What are the differences, though? Um, 
pre-trial, greater flexibility around negotiation, you know, paying damages without accepting liability, whereas a defendant in criminal law has to either plead guilty or not guilty. There's no like a sort of middle ground of, oh, we'll give you a bit of money, but we're not going to actually accept that we did anything wrong. I have to admit that. Um, so that greater sense of negotiation, the greater ability to find a win-win in the middle. Um, the plaintiff must initiate a dispute in civil law through the institution of their choice, whereas the prosecution, I mean, prosecution has no choice about where they initiate a dispute based on the type of offence it is that's going to be initiated at a certain location. Um you know, a little bit around summary offences heard in Dietable, I guess, but generally speaking, the prosecution is locked in um, and the prosecution isn't out there trying to um, have their rights returned to them. The prosecution is out there trying to basically act on behalf of society. So really different sort of purposes to what the prosecution is doing versus the plaintiff as those initiating um, parties. The plaintiff trying to restore their rights the prosecution trying to act on behalf of society. Um, and obviously the overarching obligations are a big difference. They don't exist in criminal law. Um, the overarching obligations are in the Civil Procedure Act. They are, they are a civil um, set of, I guess, guidelines um, or, or rules and values that um, a plaintiff and a defendant are meant to abide by and subsequently their legal reps as well. Um, we did also discuss in that key personnel video that we should be playing it safe and considering how we can analyse these roles as well um, because even though it's not clear or that's not listed as a key skill, it is probably likely that that's the um, level of depth you're going to need to have on these um, or on the need for legal practitioners. Um, so look, again, we know what they do. Um, that's basically just a copy and paste straight off those earlier slides. You know, they support the party. Um, they do what the party um, needs them to do to hopefully try and win their case presented in the best light possible. And we know the really big limitations. So if we're talking about it in a way weaknesses, um, if we're having to discuss um, the role of legal practitioners and the need for them, while they are incredibly important to be able to actually access the justice system, be on equal footing and get the fair outcome, they're going to cost you money and they're going to cost you a lot of money. So all of the extensive pretrial work, any time a document needs to be filed, um, any work sifting through documents that you've, um, yeah, received from the other party, um, all of this is going to be charged to you. Uh, lawyers, um, unless anything's changed, tend to charge their workout, law firms tend to charge their workout in, say, six-minute blocks, um, and they're going to charge you for every six minutes that they work on your case. And the idea being that as a lawyer, as a solicitor, your whole day is billable to a client. Um so someone's paying for the work that you're doing. So as a result, even though the law firm is paying you, they're getting in more money from your work. Um, and you have to be able to effectively justify that, which means every six minutes of work that they do on your case is going to cost you. Um, and then obviously if you then go to trial and you end up needing a barrister, you know, we're talking thousand plus dollars a day, um, sometimes even more. Um, you know, talk about in the court hierarchy video on appeals, and this is six years ago now, so who knows with cost of living and inflation. Um, but the barrister that Rebel Wilson was using was famously um, costing her around $9,000 a day. So that's forty-five grand across a week, um, which is getting pretty close to um, like getting, you know, close to our median salary in Australia. Um, definitely two weeks of, of him working on that trial. He was earning more than effectively the, the mid mid range the median worker in Australia and so the expense is a huge limitation and a huge drag on the principles of justice. So as always um, trying to tie this content back into those concepts of fairness, equality and access. And we have already spoken about that a little bit. Um, so you can pause here and try and put some of those points in if you like. But, yeah, that expense, you know, the fact that not everyone can afford it um, and how expensive it is means 
there's likely to be potentially disadvantage and disparity between the two parties based on their level of legal rep or if they can get legal rep at all. Um, and if you can't afford legal representation, do you truly have access? Can you initiate your own claim by yourself? Can you figure out um, how to wade through the information that the court's providing you on that? Can you prepare a um, written and originating document in um, the best light possible? You know, you hear examples sometimes in the news of... Um, Oh, usually like conspiracy theorists, you know, cookers, things like that, um, who try and, you know, initiate some kind of frivolous legal claim against the government or similar, and then they're complaining because the court won't accept their lawsuit. And it's usually because they haven't filled out their initiating forms, their writ or originating motion and their statement of claim correctly. They haven't got a clear, um, I guess, claim that they're making they haven't clearly laid out the basis of um why they are initiating a civil dispute and as a result the court just looks at it and goes yeah i'm not accepting this unless you do it properly and generally they don't know how um and if those people can't afford legal representation even if their disputes are often frivolous and, and ridiculous if they can't afford legal representation they can't do it themselves and they don't have access um, maybe they shouldn't have access but Ultimately, everyone should have access to the justice system. Um, and then those positives, you know, around the need for legal representation, which we have already spoken about, um, legal practitioner ensuring the best evidence and arguments are made so we should get the right outcome. Um, if you have a lawyer, it puts you on the same footing, which means no party has a disadvantage and lawyers are going to help you understand what's happening. Uh, in terms of the synthesis and the key skills, um, I've got this link here, and it's really worthwhile. I'll put it down in the comments. Um, it's really worthwhile going and having a look at the information the county court gives to self-represented litigants. Um, Magistrate Court has a similar website, as does the um, Supreme Court. But this is a, just a screenshot of the county court's one. These are all clickable links, um, so you can click in and find out a little bit more information. So, you know, I'm thinking of representing myself. How do I start a case? What if I have to defend a case? I've been served with a written originating motion. What do I do? Um, serious injury. Um, there's special rules um, and processes that are followed for serious injury cases. Um, so there's special information on that. Um, what if I need to make discovery? You know, what if I need to serve a document on someone? How does that go? Um, a judgment was made against me because I didn't do things within the time limit. Like, ah, I didn't realise because I don't have a lawyer and I probably should if I want to get the best outcome for myself. So these are all really, really good things that you can click on and find out both a little bit more about, well, I guess, why you need a lawyer um, because of how complex some of this stuff is, but also just helps you better understand the justice system as a whole, the civil justice system, which is going to help you with your content knowledge. So worthwhile having a good look. Look, ultimately, um, building off that idea of the roles of key personnel, particularly party control, and the fact that the judge is that impartial third party, even if they are very active, Ultimately, you're going to need a lawyer to present your case as well as you possibly can. You're going to need a lawyer to have fairness, equality, and access. And hopefully if someone comes to you tomorrow and says, hey, I'm starting a civil dispute, what should I do? You can be like straight away, hey, you're going to need a lawyer because if you don't have a lawyer, these are some of the challenges that you might face. Um, feedback is always below. Otherwise, thank you for watching along um, and we'll see you tuned into a video soon.